Today, we are going to explore hydroadenitis superativa, also known as HS. Now, hydroadenitis superativa is known to be a painful, chronic, inflammatory skin disease, with estimates that one out of every hundred person in the United States and Europe are affected. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Iltifat Hamsavi, an expert and researcher on hydroadenitis superativa who is affiliated with Henry Ford Health Systems Department of Dermatology in Michigan. In fact, Dr. Hamsavi served as both the president of the Hydratinitis Superativa Foundation, as well as the co-chair of the Global Vitiligo Foundation. Dr. Hamsavi, I am honored to have you on the podcast today to better understand HS and the advancements that exist for treatment. Welcome. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks for having me. Can you please explain to us what hydroadenitis superativa is and who is most affected? So hydroadenitis superativa, HS, unfortunately it's a challenging disease with a very challenging name, is a disease in which people will unfortunately suffer from deep, very, very painful boils that occur in the folds of the body, in the underarms, below the breast, groin area, buttock area, and if the boils are not enough, they explode, and then they turn into these chronically draining sinus tracts in certain disease states that also ultimately become these bound down scarred areas in more advanced disease states. So it's very, very painful. It's also got tremendous drainage along with odor, and there's also associated conditions that we can talk about in a few minutes but it's painful boils that extend into scars that cause chronic disfigurement, chronic pain and odor for patients for many, many years. It occurs mostly in younger people, starts off in the, you know, the, the pe- uh, post-pubertal phase. It tends to occur in women more than men. Two thirds of patients post-puberty are women. And then black American women are disproportionately affected. Um, and the population, as you discussed earlier, is about 1%, and it ranges from 0.75 to 1.75%, depending upon what survey technique you use. Um, and also one of the highest suicide attempts and completions in dermatology, with probably one of the lowest quality of life indexes in dermatology. Very debilitating. Is there a genetic component to the disease? Yeah, we're working through a lot of genetic assays. Our department, along with other uh, departments, have some grants looking at that. Um, about 33%, about a third of patients have a, um, a family history of HS. So do we know, are there HLA associations or specific genes right now that you're looking at? Um, so we, to my knowledge, there's no extensive or exhaustive GWAS study, but there are some genes that are based upon the gamma secretase, which comes from mostly from the Chinese studies. Um, so the countries that self-report large levels of HS, the United States, Europe, um, haven't really done an extensive GWAS study in our populations or in these populations, but the Chinese have a gamma secretase that they've identified. And that's a gene that's also so with Alzheimer's disease. We don't see Alzheimer's at a higher risk mm-hmm. in HS patients consistently, but we do look at that gene and it seems to be there's some elements of not signaling that could be defective there. But, but if you're gonna pick a gene gam secretase so far, it shows some promise as a target gene. Fascinating. Do we understand what the pathogenesis of HS is? Not really, um, mm-hmm. but we fundamentally have three targets. One is there seems to be some defect in the basement membranes or the hair follicle, maybe a partial element to it. There also seems to be defects in the innate um, elements of the immune system. And so there tends to be a, uh, a, a possible defect in complement in, in those areas. And then there's also defects in the microbiome. Um, the microbiome of HS patients is distinct, uh, both in the gut and the skin in patients with HS and even in the blood uh, um, serum of patients with HS. And the way I describe HS to my patients is that HS is a disease of the hair follicle that involves patients attacking their own normal bacteria with an immune system that's abnormally reactive to their own bacteria. So there's three targets, the hair follicle, bacteria, but unfortunately they're conventional, so they're normal bacteria, and then the immune system. 
Hmm. Do we think that hormones or androgens can play a role? We definitely do. Patients, um, boys and girls have the same rates of HS, but then when puberty hits, women's rates of HS go up quite a bit. Antiandrogens like spironolactone, birth control can all be effective. Two thirds of patients who get pregnant while have who have HS worsen. So it's definitely a hormonal component. What exactly is the molecular link? We don't understand, but clinically there's a link. So what is the typical clinical presentation you look at when a patient comes in and they're like, "We, I have this oozing, like pimple under my armpit, and it's not just a single pimple, but it's." you know, it's also in their groin and there's multiple. Um, How do you distinguish that this is HS and not another uh, disease? So there's two questions um, with a high level of sensitivity and positive predictive value um, that can identify an HS patient. And it's important for your observers as well as you, as you review this podcast to remember that it takes up to seven years on average for a patient to get diagnosed with HS when there's just two questions. Number one, do you have a boil? And have you had a boil in six months? So do you have boils in six months apart? And do the boils occur in flexural surfaces? If you ask those two questions, you often will get to a diagnosis of HS. So recurrent boils in intertrigenous areas is you know, diagnostic almost for HS versus MRSA, frankulosis, boils. Those can occur, but they don't occur in that location, and they're not recurrent. Do you see that it flares with um, periods or even pregnancy? Yep, as I described, um, it um, flares in in many women with their periods. Two-thirds of patients get worse during pregnancy. Okay. So do you think that this is a chronic disease, or is it possible that a patient may just experience it one time and never experience it again? By definition, it's chronic because you have to have it apart by six months. So yes, it's chronic. And what about emotional distress? You know, this is obviously can be very frustrating um, aesthetically and psychologically. How do you like tell patients to cope with this um, disease? Well, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we started the HS clinic at Henry Ford and uh, it was overwhelming the amount of challenges that people faced. And I think that's one of the reasons why HS was so hard to treat for so many years. A lot of us didn't want to take it on because we saw the burden in, in a few patients. So, uh, but, but it's gotten a lot better for several reasons. Number one, we had these incredible support groups. Hope for HS is just one example of one. Um, there's also HS Connect and other support groups. And Hope for HS started in Detroit, so I'm a little biased to it, but it's also one of the largest ones and has a strong association with the foundation. But we also have multiple really good support groups um, throughout the country. Support groups really help kind of unmask it. There's also culture where patients um, um, have made movies and had songs and literature about the disease. And then mental health is starting to catch up where we have mental health practitioners who we can work with, who we can identify um, to refer to. And once you make something so complicated, transparent, then you can handle it. But patients with HS came in with pain, odor, and tremendous mental health health challenges, and they still do. But now we know that from the minute we walk in, there's a high probability that they're going to have some mental health challenges, and we have teams to help. One of them is support groups. One of them is professional mental health practitioners, and then the dermatologists ultimately become almost like a primary care doctor. So they have to include mental health in all of their assessments. Um, but those are things that we can identify now. Yeah, it's very, it's so key to their improvement of their disease. Um, so do we understand if there's a correlation between patients who are overweight or even diabetic and HS? And what is that correlation? So there are correlations. Um, they're not in everybody. And as we all know, biology is not this linear process like there's groups here, there's groups here, there's groups here. So there are patients um, in, in our populations in Detroit, about 55% of our patients develop metabolic syndrome at some point. Um, so it's common, but we also have cachectic patients who have HS. Their minority tend to be male, tend to have inguinal disease, um, but the general categories are that patients with metabolic syndrome um, and a body habitus that is of an excess BMI, those conditions are a larger percentage of HS population than they are in other disease states. At the same time, 
people with HS already have so many challenges with the sense of wellness and their body habitus that talking about hygiene, talking about their body habitus can really affect the physician-patient relationship. So we encourage physicians to recognize body habitus as an element, but we don't exactly have this all worked out. And if you jump to cleanliness or hygiene, as you define it, and it's your definition, not the patient's or sciences, and also body habitus as a very first element of diagnosis, you're gonna run into problems. So it is an element, you have to manage it, but it's not the first thing you go after. A patient probably wouldn't want to return so fast. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Athena, um, one of our board members, uh, HS board members, uh, gave a lecture to our American Academy of Dermatology to a standing room only audience and received a standing ovation. And the story she told was a surgeon, I'm sure a wonderful person, told her once that she was dirty if she washed more she would uh, get control of her HS. She washed for six, seven years, refused to see family, had challenges with relationships. One sentence. So you have to be cognizant. Yeah. What other complications of the disease have you seen? We talked about mental health. What other um, disease well, complications? Well, complications skin. So there's chronic scarring, um, chronic swelling. So, so you have limited mobility. Um, then you have the mental health component. Associated comorbidities range from about two to three percent of patients develop inflammatory bowel disease. There are arthropathies, especially the lower back, associated with HS. We also will see elements of other autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, maybe lupus with HS. And so those are just some of the more common elements. But mental health, metabolic syndromes arthropathies, inflammatory bowel disease are some of the more common um, comorbidities. How do we avoid chronic sinus tract formation? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. But like all autoimmune, autoinflammatory diseases, uh, depending on how you break those things down, if you treat it early, you probably will get better control. And there's a phase in the early phase of HS that we believe that if you intervene, you may prevent sinus tract formation or sinus tunnel formation, new categories. But if you have to get into that, you want to intervene at the earlier phases. So intervening with the appropriate use of topical benzoyl peroxides, appropriate use of antibiotics, appropriate use of surgical techniques or laser hair removal. Laser hair removal helps in the first phases. Appropriate use of biologics for advancing disease that's rapidly progressive, not advanced disease, but rapidly progressive disease. And then when you have advanced disease, surgical excision sooner rather than later, all those things go into that along with antiandrogens in women and, um, and their female patients. And those are areas that you can consider uh, working on. Um, but again, active intervention. And then there's a really good set of guidelines in the JAD from the HS Foundation, both the European, both the Canadian and the American HS Foundations that list all these recommended treatments. And it's do also on the HS Foundation website. Do you recommend using HIPAA Benzoyl peroxide is what I personally recommend. Um, okay. 4% creamy wash for a patient with atopic dermatitis, 10% for other patients. Leave it on for about three to five minutes and then rinse it off. Hippocleans is also used, and there's no evidence either way. I just prefer benzoyl peroxides because they have a keratolytic effect. They break down some of the debris that occurs in the hair follicle. So in terms of, you mentioned uh, hair laser removal. Do you recommend a hair laser removal because it's important to kind of um, remove that follicle and it's like one less cause for stimulating this disease pathway? Well, so theoretically, that, that would make sense. And then this controlled trials using laser hair removal, where the hair removal side had a better response, almost like 65 to 70% improvement in the groin, about 50 to 53% in the breast area, and about 60% in the axilla when laser hair removal was done. And those studies have been replicated in other countries. It was started in Detroit, but also we've had it done in, um, in France and Italy and other countries, um, as well as uh, Wayne State University in Detroit has also been doing some Alexandrite lasers. Now, how long does it last for? In our experience, it lasts for uh, months to years. Other studies show that within three to six months, you go back to that original position. But there's something about the hair fault we don't totally understand that when it's ablated, it improves. When you excise it, it also improves. Do we, like, what is your typical um, treatment 
process. Like a patient comes in, you're like, okay, you clearly have HS. I'm diagnosing you with that. Um, do you immediately say, I'm going to give you BP wash? And I also want, there's some inflamed um, boils I would like to, in, to inject with steroids. Is that how you look at it? Or do you approach it differently than that? I approach it differently than that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk in, make the diagnosis as we talked about those two questions. Then I'm going to try to categorize them. So there's a thing called a Hurley staging, which is only the anatomic classification. And the fulcrum of that is a sinus tunnel. So nodules, stage one. Nodules that connect, stage two. Interconnected sinus tunnels that are forming across that become a mass of HS lesions, that's stage three. So nodules, sinus tract, interconnected sinus tracts, those are the areas. And so then if you're in a sinus tract, you're going to have to remove that, either through de-roofing and minor surgeries on the office or excision, more extensive done in outpatient clinics as well, um, that do a lot of HS surgery as well as ORs. So if you have those elements in, your, in the back of your brain, then the other thing you want to look at is stability. Is, is that patient getting multiple new nodules? And then... Once you have that categorized, you want to have an overall chronic disease management routine, and then use interlesional steroids to help with flare-ups. But you're not going to use your interlesional steroids to prevent progression. You're going to use that to help with the flares. So I first take a look, make the diagnosis. I decide what the anatomic um, subtype is. Then I can decide on surgery or other options, and then look at stability. If they're very unstable, I'm going to go to very aggressive options. I'll go all up to the biologic much faster if I've already seen numerous nodules in the nutritious areas plus sinus tract formation. But I almost look at sinus tract formation as erosive arthritis. That is an endpoint I wanna avoid. Um, and that's our, our goal. And what are the future, you know, you mentioned biologics, what future treatment options for HS are in the pipeline? Are you working on any, are there any clinical trials going on that you could share with us? There's numerous excellent clinical trials coming up. Uh, we're part of a few of them. There's other groups are doing um, much more than we are. Um, so laser hair removal, we talked about, there's modified versions of that. There's new dietary studies looking at that. There's also extensive development in the biologic arena. So we have TNF-alpha inhibitors, adalimumab, fully approved. I have a conflict of interest. I've, I've been working with Abby as a consultant, unpaid until I'm done with my presidency at the HS Foundation. Also, there are different variations of TNF-alpha inhibitors, the infusions, such as infliximab versus the subcutaneous. Then there's IL-17 inhibitors, showing some promise. IL-23s in some of the outcome measures did not show promise, but we think that there's an element over there. C5 inhibitors are also showing some promise. And uh, there's also small molecule JAK inhibitors that are also showing promise. And I'm sure there's more than that, but if you're interested, we had an article in the JAD in 2020, it lists all the upcoming studies looking at this. Very exciting. Uh, I do want to ask you more about the dietary modification. You know, everyone wants to know is how do I change my diet? Will this go away? So what are, what have they found um, in terms of diet? Let's finish up with diet and um, diet. We are actively doing studies and the HS Foundation has a grant system called the Danby grant system. So our center has one of those. And Marissa Serezny, one of our trainees, is working on our researchers and trainees is working on that. So we're using different types of blood assays to establish what inflammatory foods are, then linking them with a dietitian who's got a lot of experience with autoimmune diseases, following a LEAP protocol to see if that will have an impact. And they identify inflammatory foods. Patients report that milk and breads and glycemic, high glycemic foods can trigger HS. We're looking at that counting up the number of nodules using a scoring system called the high score. Then we're also doing IHS-4 plus patient report outcomes and ultrasound to see if a dietary modification will make a difference. That's one diet, dietary area. Other people are looking at the microbiome of the gut to see if they can modify that with diet. Um, and then patients are self-reporting and, and there's a lot of validity to that. So Very exciting. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hamsavi, for joining us today at the Derm Club podcast. And we look forward to seeing... Um, what's out there for the future of HS. Um, it looks very promising. Well, thank you, Hannah. It was nice meeting you and thanks for taking the time to speak to me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Derm Club podcast. If you found the discussion today to be valuable, please subscribe and share. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode as we continue to delve into dermatology and skincare with the world experts.